Welkom allemaal op het webinar After Dinner met Nancy. Nou, degene die mij volgen, die weten dat ik op dit moment nu in Denver zit. Ik krijg daar nu een week lang traumabehandeling van Nancy samen met een collega van haar. Zij zijn echt de experts op het gebied van reactieve hechtingsstoornis. En omdat het rond de feestdagen is op dit moment, leek het ons leuk om een cadeautje aan jullie te geven. Nou, en dit cadeautje is in de vorm van een webinar. Dat vonden we super leuk om te doen. Dus bij deze hebben wij nu een uur lang vragen beantwoord en uh, bepaalde inzichten en tools met jullie gedeeld in dit webinar. Ik wens jullie heel veel kijkplezier en warme groetjes van Esther en Nancy. So, um, I got a, a few questions from uh, the, the audience and um, I think we go per question. Uh, I, I tell them what they are and then you can explain your, uh, your, your, your view about it. Uh, well, the first question is from Miriam. So, uh, Miriam, I really hope you're here. Um, it's about her stepdaughter. And um, there was a situation where the father, by accident, cut his finger and uh, he was bleeding and he needed to be stitched. And the daughter was really in um, survival mode, so screaming, uh, uh, but also cursing and, and hitting. And um, even if the whole situation is already uh, back to normal, so the father went, went to the hospital, got stitched, and, and everything should be back to, to relaxed mode, she will stay in this mode of screaming, crying, cursing. And um, the question is, how do I deal with that? Okay. So, when we have a child that has a problem with um, the stress is too high and she gets overwhelmed, especially it sounds like blood, because there was another incident with the brother, um, is too much for her. So, we have her build her ability to handle it by practicing. Okay. Okay. So, we would have three or four times a day after that where she would... Um, you know, the, the brother and the dad would put some ketchup. Oh. Ke ah, 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 you know, like they're really hurt. Oh. So she can go crazy and calm down and go crazy and calm down more often to learn how to handle things. And then practice when somebody's hurt, we go to them, we help them. We don't get wrapped up in our stuff when they need us. We reach out to others. Um, but in the meantime, she has created a lot of havoc for the family and very much stress. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to do a little role play. I have, um, Jasmine is here. Jasmine. <laughs> okay. So we'll do. Let me move this out of the way. All right. So yeah, scoot your chair in. There we go. A little bit more. A little bit more. Okay. So we'll pretend that it was Jasmine. It was not Jasmine, but we'll pretend. Okay. So Jasmine, what happened? I cut the finger. No, your your dad cut the finger. Oh, your dad cut the you finger. You were screaming. I'm screaming. Yes, yes. Good job telling the truth. So then she's not mine, so I would high five. Okay. If she's my child, I would give her a big hug for telling the truth. All right. And um, what are you going to do nice for your father? Uh, uh, an exercise? In a a chore. A chore. A chore. A chore. Yeah. Okay, a chore. so you're going to help him with a job, okay, that he has to do. So, what job does your dad do that you could help him with? You can't go to the office. Uh, I can help with the work. Okay, what work at home does your father do you could help with? Um, with the uh, fruit, the vegetables. Mm -hmm. That's his work at the office, but at home. To help the family. Je moet een taakje van papa gaan overnemen. Of je moet iets doen om het goed te maken voor papa. Um, clean the room. Oh, clean the vacuum his room. Oh, okay. That sounds like a good plan. I think you would like that. All right. So when the children take from the relationship, we have them give back by doing an act of kindness. And, you know, at the time, it's, needing to deal with the medical emergency situation. So um, we wouldn't deal with it right then. We would have them, you know, you need to scream, that's fine. You go scream there, we're going to take care of the medical needs. And then after the medical needs are all taken care of, then we go to the child and help them sort it out. Okay? Yeah. 
So, Miriam, I hope that, that, uh, that, that your question is um, clear and that you can uh, help with this. I think you have a name for that process also, eh? when you do the, the, oh, the different yes. uh, steps. We call it brain-based behavior yeah. interventions. Yeah, yeah. And we usually do a brain shifter first and then ask them what happened and then have them come up with an act of kindness to give back. But when it's the next day and they have already calmed down, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes they don't need to do the brain shifting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the tools that you developed are not just tools that you thought of. It's really like well-based okay. evidence before uh, you practice it on the, on the kids. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of research. Yeah, exactly. Um, then I had another question from Linda. So thanks for your question. Linda is a therapist. And Linda wants to ask Nancy, uh, what do you do if the parents see the behavior of the kid as the um, the cause of their problems. Do you under, understand what she's saying? The parents yeah. see the behavior of the child as the cause of the parents' problems? Of the problems. Um, when, when she gets the parents into the therapy uh, room, um, the parents have a hard time um, looking over the behavior of the of the children so they get stuck into looking at the behavior and see that as the cause of the problem okay okay and we often do when we have a child who's lying we want to focus on stopping them from lying if they're stealing we want to focus on the stealing and the therapist's job is to help us to look at why and a lot of times we ask the child, why did you lie? Why did you steal? Because we're using the logic part of our brain and we want to understand it. But the children, they don't know why. They just, I'm mad. I stole it because I was mad. You know, I lied because I was angry. Um, so when we have a mental health professional, they don't focus on the child. They don't focus on the parents. They focus on the gap between the two of them which is where the problem is. And if we look at the brain, let me see if I can get this up here. This is a, a normal, healthy brain. You see the red part, let me see if I can hold it really still. The red part is the most electrical energy. You see in the top area there, that's in the forehead. Where logic and reasoning is, that's where we can answer why. Okay, and then if we look at the abused child's brain, one who has too much trauma, then we see the red part is in the back, which is where we have arguing and fighting and defense. I didn't do it. It's not my fault. You're the bad one. I didn't do it. You know, and all of the screaming and fit throwing that comes from the back part of the brain. So we use the brain-based behavior interventions to shift gears from back here to up here. When we get angry, it lights that back part up and then we have more arguing, more screaming, more fighting. And when there's any alert or an alarm, like um, the child we talked about earlier where the dad was injured and the brother was also injured and there was blood, and then the alarm sets that off and normally a baby can what they call self-regulate. They get upset and they can calm down. Our children who have this back part so big, they can't calm down quickly. They get stuck and it just goes over and over with the screaming and they can't calm themselves. Tiny babies learn to calm their heart when it's pounding and they're scared. They learn to calm it by being held up against mom's heart or dad's heart. Not anybody else, but mom or dad's heart. Then their heart Here's the parent's heart physically, and their heart goes into sync. So instead of here, it calms, and they learn to get upset and calm, get upset and calm. There's a loud noise. What was that? Oh, mom's not scared. I can calm myself. But when our babies have a trauma base, or they haven't been held enough because they're sick or in the hospital or mom's in the hospital, whatever separated them, they don't learn to calm themselves and they literally get stuck and they will scream until they have no more energy left. And we have to help them to learn to self-regulate, which is little fun things like, oh, it's ketchup. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, my brother's acting. 
oh, it's silly, you know, but we have to shift from here to here from survival. I have to fight for my life. It's a big tragedy to it's just ketchup. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a nice one. And the therapist, it's their job to help the parents to understand that and not focus on here, but getting both parts working more effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do want to uh, add something to it. Like most kids, they have the the behavior outwards, so at least you can see it. But with my daughter, the behavior you have like three things, three th different things you can do. Like fight, flight, or freeze. So the fight is the screaming and the yelling. The flight, okay, they leave, but you also have to freeze. And for me, it took me years to understand that that was also a survival uh, mode. And before I didn't know uh, what was happening, but now I can really see it in my child. At one point she goes into a survival freeze mode and before I would be like, or screaming to her or preaching to her and it was like empty inside. But now I recognize the empty face and I know it's so useless to scream back or to preach back when they're in that mode. They need help to get out of the mode yes. or that, that, that Primical, primitive part of the brain, and then you can have contact uh, again. Absolutely, so that was uh, what I want to ask. Add to it, and um, then, 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 then I have uh, Debbie. Um, let me see if I can. Maybe I'm out of my laptop. Oh no, uh, Debbie, Debbie, Debbie. Thank you so much, Debbie, for your email. It was a nice, um, um, big email. Um, I won't tell the whole story, but um, the questions that you want to ask Nancy is how do I deal with the behavior of your son that is really like, um, I don't know the translation, but really like zuigend, um, how do you, zuigend, like really like manipulating, uh, teasing, we talked about it uh, at your ranch, like I forgot the name, I forget the name right now, but it's really like not externally, um, it's really, I think it's, uh, oh, I forgot the word, um, sneaky, I think it's the word sneaky, okay, thank you. really like, yeah, all the time teasing and never stop, but it's never really out there, it's always like in a sneaky way, okay. so how do you deal with that? Um, so is he stealing or bothering people or uh, when, when he's being sneaky uh, and how old is he? Uh, 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 let me see. Mm, I don't see ages, the ages of the boys. Mm, no, but she does say, uh, oh, this is another son. No, oh, this is another son. Mm, 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 mm. No. Okay. No, I don't know. Um, so when we have a child who's being sneaky and stealing, for example, or sneaky and bothering the brother and, you know, poking and poking and, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, you know, that kind of stuff. I think they're more, they're, uh, I have a, um, a stepmother of a twin uh, and there are 11. Okay, 11, so that's good. Um, so we keep them separate if they're bothering each other. So they, one would play over here, one would play over there and I would be in the middle. Um, until they play appropriately individually and with me, I don't have them play with each other. If they're being sneaky about other things, the stealing or whatever, um, it's what we look at their emotional age and many of our children are very, very young. Their body's older, 11 years old we have for these twins, but emotionally many times they're two or three years old emotionally and so what would we do with a two-year-old? We keep them close, and when they're saying, I need you to watch me, I need to be close, they do behaviors constantly, over and over and over, um, harm, harming themselves or, um, you know, someone else, to let us know they need to be very, very close. So I keep them within six feet of me all the time, um, all the day time, so that I can monitor them like I would if I had a a toddler, a little two-year-old, yep. yep. you don't watch them, they, you know, drink out of the toilet and <laughs> you know, stuff, so get into the soap and put in their eyes. So we have to watch very, very closely with the two-year-old until they get stronger and a little more mature. And when our children are 11 in their body, but two or three in their mind and in their heart, 
we keep them close until they grow emotionally, and then we give them appropriate freedoms. So it's all part of the healing process, yeah. pulling them close. Yeah. And, and what you said is really important, and that was also really important for me to, um, to understand about uh, my daughter, is that you have three different ages. You have your calendar age, and then your emotional age, and your mental age. And uh, especially with the traumatized kids, the ages are very far apart. Absolutely. Yeah, and that really, really helped me in understanding my daughter when she had like typical uh, behavior. So I hope uh, it was a good answer for you, Debbie, and that you can work uh, from that. Um, yeah, she's. I've been reading the email again now, and she says like they do a lot of crazy. They have a lot of crazy behavior. They put sugar in the shampoo. Uh, when you tell them that you, they did it, they 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 explode. So what she's asking also is how to deal with taking stuff from the cabaret, cabin when it's not allowed. How do you deal with that? Okay, um, opening the refrigerator or any of the kitchen cabinets is very disrespectful. Uh, it is mom's kitchen or dad's kitchen, whoever is the yeah. chef in the house, and um, the child doesn't have any business. It's like going in your drawers in your office at work. They, It's not appropriate, and so um, we need to tighten the boundaries <laughs> help them to learn that this is not a re there's no reason for them to be getting into the cabinets and the cupboards. Mom prepares the food or dad, whoever's in charge of that, and feeds the children. The children do not go and feed themselves, especially when they have had early trauma. We feed our children and that's how we nurture. It's how we give them back. And when they are nurturing themselves by just getting their own food, it interferes with the healing process. Once they're healed, we can certainly leave a bowl of fruit out and they can get an apple whenever they want to or whatever. Um, but I used to have big teenage boys, a lot of them, and they could open the fridge and clean out the whole refrigerator and there was the food I had ready to prepare for dinner was now gone and it was a disaster. So I learned very quickly that they needed to, those were off limits. The answer was no, they didn't touch them, and then um, because they were right close to me, they reached to open it, I would have them do a brain shifter. What happened? I started to open the cabinet. Good job telling the truth, and what are you going to do nice for me to make it up to me for, you know, going over the boundary? And then they would say, I oh, will wipe the counters for you. I said, okay, that's great, or whatever they came up with. But it was corrected quickly. Just reaching for it was where the correction was, not after they opened it, got the stuff out, and ate it, and then I'm correcting. The correction is when they reach for the cabinet, that's where we stop the behavior. So we want to be very, very in tune. And a lot of people say, it's so hard. It is hard, but it's not as hard as trying to help them with it late. <laughs> So in the beginning, we have to have what we call eagle eyes and watch every little move they make and all the activities and guide them and teach them so that they know where the limits are. Once they start helping us in the kitchen, because they've quit picking their boogers and putting it in the food and different things. <laughs> I want clean children, you know. There's no urine going different places and they follow directions excellently then I will allow them to come in the kitchen and help me where they're stirring and I'm putting the things in and they're stirring and then they add to they can then begin to measure properly and so they learn how to cook and they learn life skills but they have to learn skills first before they're going to be in my kitchen because I, I have to have things done properly I don't want the sugar they're putting in the shampoo <laughs> to go in the spaghetti <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing that you also uh, taught me that was really um, useful. That um, don't let it go for too long. That's what I did. Oh, she can't help it. She's tired. And but now I, uh, you taught me as soon, even if it's an eye roll or like mm -hmm. oh, correct it because if you let it go, it goes from the little movement behavior disrespectful to higher and higher. And that's was really helped me with my. Um, uh, special kid, but also with my 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 son, which is he's mm -hmm. like healthy attached. But even for my son, it's really good to to uh, experience for him. Okay, this is acceptable and this is not acceptable, but already on a very small uh, level. 
Um, I'm going to share one more question from Debbie with you, and that's um, what kind of therapy, uh, because they did already a lot with the two children, and you're not familiar with all the institutes. I know them, but um, very dedicated parents. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, I, I can so. see that from the from the mail. But she, she's asking, what can we do in the future for therapy? Now we're in uh, America, and, and I live in Holland. So, but maybe you can tell something about therapies that you think are very useful. Um, therapy is very, very important for our children, and unfortunately, there in the Netherlands. Um, we have not found a therapist who's trained to deal with children with attachment issues or reactive attachment disorder or even severe trauma. Um, there may be some, we just haven't gotten their connection, but here you are all the way in the United States because you also could not find the right therapy for your daughter. And um, we need to get more training there for the mental health professionals. I know there are a lot of very caring professionals. We have some that have asked questions that are on the webinar that are looking for answers. How can I help my clients better? Um, we use uh, narrative therapy, which is um, a style of EMDR, which was developed for the war veterans because they found our children have as much trauma <laughs> many times as someone who has been to war. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been a very helpful therapy, but if they aren't trained in how to do it with children who don't trust, then they will say, hold that thought, watch my fingers, and we have a child who will not hold the thought, who will not watch the fingers, and the therapy is useless, and we've paid money and gone all the way to the set the time aside and everything, and, and it can't work. So um, we have had to find ways for the therapy to work with a child who will not cooperate, um, who doesn't think there's anything wrong with them. It's my mother that has a problem. I'm perfect, you know. And until they get healthy enough to see they are the one with the problem, we have to help them. Like, you know, with a little child, we take them to the doctor. We don't say, you know, do you want to go to the doctor? <laughs> we just take them. So they're too sick to know. And a therapist needs to know how to work with yeah. a client who doesn't see any difficulty, that it's their mother. If their mother would just stop asking them to brush their teeth and make their bed and do their schoolwork, then they would be fine. That's what they think. Okay? Well, a loving mother does say you have to wash and you have to make your bed and you have to get your schoolwork and your home chores done. Yeah. So they need to learn to cooperate and follow the leader. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to add a, a little bit about that, is that um, the, the stuff that you have told me, um, I didn't get uh, in Holland anywhere, but I did, I was lucky to uh, to do find good therapy, and I discussed it with uh, with Nancy, that's the differentiatie therapy and the fast therapy, you were not uh, familiar with it, eh? with the face ther therapy, face you know, therapy. alcohol. No, no, no. Yeah, oh, the we still face, the research on it. Yeah, no, we, we, I tried to discuss with Nancy about the different therapies and um, she was not aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but the therapies that I did was the uh, differentiatie therapy and the fast therapy. And did, that did help us a lot, but only until a certain point. And um, we were also very lucky that we were living in a big city. So at one point we had like two years of a um, um, dagbehandeling. But that's only for the lucky ones and also for parents who really are uh, trying to find the right uh, therapy and have um, the right uh, enough time to do the therapy. And that's quite uh, yeah, d difficult. I know in my community that there's a lot of um, uh, single moms with three kids. So how can you completely go for, for therapy for your uh, children? That's, that's very difficult. So um, yeah, we still have a lot to do. <laughs> we need more help everywhere. Yeah, yeah even yeah, yeah. in the United States, is not enough. Not enough help. Hmm. Um, then I also, before I left to Denver to see uh, uh, Nancy, I asked also in the community, "What do you want to learn from from Nancy?" So I have a couple of questions, and um, um, I, I got many actually, but I have um, some questions that were uh, asked over and over again. So I want to ask. What, some of those questions also, and uh, one of it is that it got like the most crosses, and it's like, 
how do I explain what my child has and how do I deal with the surrounding, so with family, with friends, with the teacher, um, that don't understand because very often, also with my daughter, she's just nice and charming to other people or to the teacher and at home she has a totally different face. So how can you deal with the not getting the support from the, the people around you and how do you explain? Okay, so we have two questions. <laughs> yeah, it's two questions, so. but they're both yeah. you know, very, very good questions. Um, I used to try to get people to understand what my life was like living with a very disturbed child and I would spend a lot of time telling all the horrible things my child did so that people would have compassion for me and be able to support me better and then I realized they could not understand. It was not understandable. I, I know. Um, living with our children, with the pain that we have as parents, with the worries that we have, with the exhaustion and the fear because of their behaviors from their past, um, no one can understand unless they live with it. They can't. So it isn't that these people are wrong or stupid in any way, it's that they cannot conceive of our children the way they act when they look, our children put a mask, okay, and the mask is very cute and charming, aren't they sweet and charming, but behind the mask is anger and fear and I hate you and you're the worst mother in the world and oh, you're my favorite neighbor, you know, you're my best teacher, you know, so we have the mask and the real child. So the mother sees the real child. Sometimes the father also sees the real child, but they target the mother. So I talk to people who have the same children I do, and I know they understand. And the people out in the community, I don't share with them because they cannot understand. There's no way. But then we have grandparents and um, the people who do need to understand what's going on. And for them, I explain, if my child had diabetes, how do you say diabetes? Yeah, diabetes. Okay. Um, would, and I told you, my child has diabetes. Would you question me? Would you say, well, she doesn't look like she has diabetes to me? Or would you just believe that the doctor has said my child has this condition? Well, people will just believe you because they don't look different on the outside to a child who does not have diabetes. Then, if I say, please do not give my child with diabetes a big piece of cake at your party, would you say, oh, you're a mean mother. Yeah. You're yeah. awful. You won't let your child have a big piece of cake. I will give your child a big piece of cake because your child should have cake. Or would you say, oh, with diabetes, this child cannot have cake. The child could end up in the hospital. Yeah. So our children who have emotional disturbance from trauma have to have limits and boundaries that are different from a child who has not had that early history. <clears throat> and we give them too much freedom, they can end up in the hospital, but it's the psychiatric hospital, okay? <laughs> the psychiatric, not the physical hospital. <clears throat> With our children, we have to do things that are hard. We have to say, no, you cannot go and play at the neighbor's house or whatever it is. We have to do things that are very difficult just as a parent has to do when they have a child with diabetes. You have to have a syringe with a needle with medicine in it and you have to poke it in your child's skin to keep them alive. How hard is that for a parent and for a child too? And when you have the syringe and you're ready to poke it in your child and somebody says, oh, don't do that. I never did that with my children and they turned out just fine. You're a crazy mother poking that in your child. You should not be doing that. Well, we would say, you don't understand. My child has diabetes and they need this medicine. With our child that has emotional disturbance, they need to be treated differently and when we are questioned and challenged, it makes it much harder for us as parents and much, much harder for the children, and it hurts. So when we can explain it that way to grandparents that need to get it, they can go, oh, okay, this makes sense to me. I need to believe you, and I need to trust you that you are a loving parent doing what you believe is right for my grandson or my granddaughter. 
rather than thinking you're evil <laughs> or crazy and you are trying to hurt my grandchildren. I need to trust you, love you, and believe in you. And it's like, yep, that would work for me. If you would trust me and love me and believe in me, it would work really well. Because working with a sick child is exhausting and demoralizing and we feel like bad parents and we feel like failures and we feel useless and then when those that are supposed to love us and support us hurt us more it makes it unbearable so I know I've been there we have to support each other that's the best way to do it yeah. parents who live it and understand standing together we know we're not alone, we're not crazy, we're not bad parents. We have a sick child and we're looking for the right answers to help them to heal. Yeah, that's nice. Because what you're saying also about uh, what, what I felt, the emotion that I felt throughout the years uh, was loneliness. Yeah. Um, that's also because that's why I started this whole community, that's why I wrote my ebook in the end, is that um, because the other people don't see it and don't, they don't understand that you live your battle all by yourself in your own uh, family. You're lucky if your husband sees it and understands it, but very often they're very different to the to the father. So um, the overall emotion that I had was loneliness. I felt so lonely, and then, like you said, I tried to explain. Yeah, but she does this and this. And this. Oh, my kid does that too. Oh, but this is different, and she's rejecting me really on my my soul level. Like I like I'm not a good mom, and I'm the only mom in the world that yeah has a child that doesn't love me, and that feeling is so horrible and so oh, yeah you carry that it hurts yeah it hurts it's such yeah. a pain, and still you have to go on with your life and go to the the school and the guy and, and be all like lovey uh, happy jolly, mm -hmm. but it's such a struggle. And uh, yeah, well, that was really that's, hard. but that's why it's so wonderful that you have built this community. You have yeah. three thousand people yes. that can talk to each other and understand. Yeah, we're not alone. Yeah, we have all these people who understand us, and we can share thoughts and ideas yeah. and come together to help our children to heal. And we can share the victories. Of, yeah, my child didn't lie all day long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have victories like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My she, child brushes teeth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, she didn't put all her food back on her plate after she ate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole community and the whole uh, yeah, the, the training that I give now started actually from loneliness. Like at one point, I was thinking, this cannot be that I'm the only mother in the world with a child like this and with feelings like this I just couldn't believe it and but then where to start because in Holland I also found out is that um, I was lucky with the therapy and the institutes but I was never connected to other mothers because at one point I was like can we not like have a coffee morning where we can get together no privacy privacy and I was like privacy I don't want privacy I want to have a connection I already feel so lonely <laughs> And then at one point I said, okay, if nobody can create it for me, I'll try to create it myself. And first I started like blogging and I was like, who wants to read like all these stories, you know, like about my family, but within no time there was followers and from that I yeah, I also because of your content I created an ebook Monster in the Glass because I found out that one of the biggest problems that the people in the community have is yeah, at one point the kids go to school Oh, yeah. How do you tell the teacher, even if it's a teacher who really wants to help, mm -hmm. how do you explain what your kid needs? Because everything needs to be reversed. The whole way of thinking needs to be reversed. And that's why I wrote the book, Monster in the Class. And I don't talk about that the child is a monster, but we call it at home a hechtings monster. So it's not the fault of the child, but this, some creepy monster mm -hmm. who went into the classroom or went into your uh, home that is like destroying your family and that's the reason why I, I wrote the book and with the book I created the community mm -hmm. and so it's excellent it's very really nice yeah it's really nice um, let me see we have 10 more minutes um, I think we covered a lot already oh yeah did we do line sorry did we do line a little bit yeah, okay. line. but we yeah. can um, we can do lying. And another one is also that um, I experienced from my own uh, experience, especially in the most difficult years, is that 
you think you get somewhere, so I call it, because uh, I also blog about it, two steps forward, but then three steps back. Yes. And that is really like, oh, put so much effort into a therapy or into practicing certain things, and then for some reason, like, they all move back. Mm. And the way I describe that is we have this rope of hope, <laughs> okay? We have hope, and we're hanging on to hope that things can get better, that the child will stop the behaviors and we can have joy and peace again. And then the rope breaks, and we have no hope. And, oh, I can't live like this. It's awful. I can't do this anymore. I can't do it one more day. My child will end up in prison or, you know, some horrible thing. And the hopelessness, the despair of not having that to cling to. So what I did for me, instead of looking at it as two steps forward and three steps back, I look at it as a roller coaster. Okay, so it's, it's always forward. So we're doing better behaviors, it's good, you know, they're having a good day, they're being kind and respectful. Oh, we got some bad behaviors going on. They're being rude and destructive. Oh, now we're having a good day. So the roller coaster rolls less and less and less until they level out. But I don't do, we went here, we went here. But, oh, no, we're clear back at the beginning. I have to start over because it, it made me feel defeated. So I see it, we're doing well. We're having a you know a tough time. The child is doing well. The child is doing, and I got off the roller coaster. I stay on the platform, and the child rides the roller coaster, and I watch them, and I help them with what they need. But I don't ride it with them. Okay, we're good. We're good. Oh no, it's terrible. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's terrible. Ha! Ah, ooh! Ha! Ah, because <laughs> I was too much. <coughs> so I got off the roller coaster. I watch the child ride it, but it's a forward roller coaster. And sometimes roller coasters have a loop de loop. <laughs> a loop, yeah. <laughs> but it's forward. So I needed that hope to always cling to that my child could get better because they can't believe in themselves if we don't believe in them. And when we feel hopeless, they have no hope either. They're stuck. So they have to know we believe they can be 100% healthy, that they can be the superstar that they were born to be. And when we believe in them, they can believe in themselves, and we see steady progress. But when we lose our hope, it's bad for everybody. So roller coaster. Yeah, well, thanks. I'm, I'm uh, learning something as we doing the <laughs> webinar. Uh, nice, nice. Um, yeah, maybe we can, um, maybe you can share something about Lyme. Because that's like a big, uh, big, it's very, very big. And some people say, well, just don't ask them, and then they won't lie. <laughs> you know, is it Tuesday? No, it's Wednesday. Um, they lie about everything. Some of them, it, like, becomes their hobby. Like, some people play the tuba, and our children <laughs> lie instead of playing the tuba. Um, so I do ask them, did you take that? You know, or where is my my cell phone, you know, whatever, I, I do ask them so that they can learn to be honest. No matter what, I want them to be honest. I used to get angry when they would lie to me. I said, don't you lie to me in a kiddo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I found very quickly that makes them lie more, and it activates that back part of the brain, so I was just defeating myself. So I, I had to stop getting angry. And that doesn't make sense. I, I want you to get happy when your child lies. It sounds like you're crazy. <laughs> but what I did was I looked at um, what is it that is good about what the child has to have to be able to tell the truth. Um, I mean, to lie. In order to lie, a child has to have courage, right? That's a lot of courage to stand up to an adult and lie takes some courage. And courage is a good thing. Um, they have to be able to think very quickly to come up with the lie. Quick thinking is a good thing. They have to be creative to come up with the great huge tale they just made up. Okay. Um, they have to have a good memory to keep the story straight. They have to be very good actors or actresses to, oh, I didn't do it. I really didn't do it. I would never, I, you know, yeah. great acting skills. Okay, and there's other things as well, but those are all very good skills that can help a child to be successful in life. 
So instead of looking at the lie itself, I looked at, look at how quick my child came up with that story. And it was very creative. And look at she's clinging to it. And big drama that she didn't even practice. Very well done. So instead of getting angry, I would get happy. And I didn't say all of that to my child. I thought it so that I could smile and keep my eyes happy. And then I would say, what do you think I think? Oh, you think I'm lying. Right, so as long as I think you're lying, you will be the one that will be taking care of, you know, whatever it is. You will be the one that will be paying me back for my cell phone until I find if I have made an error and it was your brother, then, you know, I will pay your brother back and I will pay you back. I mean, excuse me. I will pay you back for what you have paid for the cell phone already and your brother will then be paying for the cell phone. But right now, who do you think I think took the cell phone? You think I did it. Right, so you will be paying for the cell phone. So here's a list of chores that you can um, begin doing to earn money to pay for the cell phone. It is $500. So um, you can pay $10 every day. And I want you to tell me how many days it will take you at earning $10 a day to pay for the cell phone. So then they've got to do the math. And each day they work toward paying for the cell phone. and. And then I find out their brother's the one who stole it, and they've earned five hundred dollars. <laughs> no. I give them the five hundred dollars and a bonus, and then the brother starts doing ten dollars a day chores to pay back. And then my other child is now wealthy; <laughs> they have all this money. <laughs> so it all works out. I just I stopped using anger in parenting with the children because it wasn't working for me. I was cranky all the time. Because they do one thing and then another and then another. I don't want to be angry. I want to have a life filled with joy and a home filled with happiness. So I found ways to stay happy even with their sick behaviors. And it wasn't I was happy they were lying. Okay. So I took the lies and I put them where they belong. And lies fit very well in a story they wrote okay, or a play they're writing. So I would have them write a story for the family. And when I would say, you know, do you have homework? You have schoolwork to do tonight? Oh, no, I don't have any schoolwork. The brother was run over. The teacher's brother was run over by a bus. So he was so upset he didn't give us any homework. I say, oh, all right, put that in your story for tonight. Mom, it's true. His brother really was run over by a bus. Good, put that in your story tonight, too, that you're lying about lying. So then when they... We have our, our evening meal, and then the child stands up and reads the story about the teacher's brother being run over by a bus, so there's no homework, because of course they have homework, you know. And, but we're like, hmm, maybe that happened? Yeah. Mm, would the brother be in school? <laughs> this brother, no. Uh, so I have them write a story. They read it to the family. We, Cheer. Oh, it's a very well done story. And every time they lie, oh, write that in your story for tonight. And then they weave their stories together into a really interesting story that I keep. And I take them when they're done reading them and put them in a nice treasure chest. So when they grow up and they're a famous author, you know, and they have a million dollars selling book, if they get writer's block, I can pull that treasure chest of all the stories out and give it to them, and they have all kinds of great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we. I want to ask you something because that's something I learned this week with you. Can you uh, can you say something about do, doing chores, the scrushes doing in house? Um, why you do that with your kids, and why it's so important for your kids to have chores? Because uh, Nancy told me to have. A half an hour a day of chores every day for all the kids. So maybe you can explain something. Oh yes, um, helping around the house, vacuuming and dusting and cleaning the floors and pitching in to take care of your house makes your house a home. When mom does all the work, she is the slave, and the child is to be entertained. Then they grow up and they think I'm supposed to be made happy by my mother. If I'm not happy, it's my mother's fault and I should be angry with her. So we don't want that dynamic in there. We want everybody works together and the fun starts when the house is clean. When we've got our work done, then we play. Um, as adults, as children, we get our chores done, then we play. And each day we do a little piece of taking care of the house so that it's, 
it gets clean and it stays clean. Um, they learn life skills. They learn activating this part of the brain by focusing on getting their job done, what we call A+. Plus. It's done very well. All right? So in building their ability to focus, to watch for details, to remember where the items need to be put back, if they're wiping the sink around the bathroom where all the, the items belong, so that our children really like to rearrange things. And, um, well, I think it looks better this way, and, oh, I forgot where it goes, and whatever. And their employer may not appreciate them putting the machinery back the way they think it would look better, or whatever. <laughs> their employer will want things arranged the way the employer wants it. So we're helping them to learn now how to be prepared for their job later in their life, for their career, by following instructions, following the lead, doing it correctly, building their brain so that they can work effectively and efficiently, and they have life skills to take care of their home, have it clean, so when we come to dinner at our children's house to visit our grandchildren, <laughs> Their home is clean, and I know they know how to take care of it and keep it in a healthy way. Okay. Yeah, and what's also what you told me this week is that um, you explain the chore, and then she um, or the child can ask, okay, what do I need, or I don't understand this or that. And then when you explain, and if you check if the child understood, it needs to do the chore, but then it needs to do the chore and the problem solving within the chore by itself. So it's not allowed to ask anymore and to solve it. And I thought that was really a learning moment for me. Um, when your kid does the chore and it, it, it comes to certain challenges, uh, it needs to find a solution, a solution within the chore. And when you start, when they're young, in your home, they feel safe in finding little um, uh, solutions for little problems. I thought it was so, because before I was like, why do they need to do chores? <laughs> <laughs> but now I understand it. Sure. And I also can see in the doing the chore, um, they try to test you. So, is it clean? Mm -hmm. Well, I can see from like three meters away, it's not totally clean. Um, so within the doing the chores, they can learn by okay. Let me test my mother. Oh, she's she's not uh, she's not going for it. So in the end, they they learn how to do A plus at this team plus uh, uh, quality chores, and that's so important for later on in life. But yeah, it was a very good lesson. Yeah. Um, even kijken wat we nog meer hebben. Mm, yeah, to get the right help, you cannot help them with. Um, did we say, because I have a lot of um, red crosses with um, a big problem, and I, I, I have that too with, uh, with uh, my uh, daughter, is that they, when you don't give them attention, they want all the attention, and when they do get the full attention, they reject. So, aantrekken and afstoten. So, um, do you understand what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. how do you deal with that? Because uh, as a mom, you have the longing for the closeness and, and the loving, and um, they reject it, but then when you deny them or when you're like all fed up with them, they want to have your attention. So as a mom, you go crazy. <laughs> well, and they are kind of the opposite of what you expect with a normal healthy child who has yeah. that trauma. Um, they don't do that, but ours do, and people don't understand. So I, I know my child is sick. And I don't get angry for their behaviors. When I go to hug them and they get stiff, I cuddle them, I rock them, I say, oh my goodness, you're so stiff. It's a good thing you have an awesome mom like me to help you to soften up. So I get playful and, and fun with it instead of you get stiff when I hug you because you're rejecting me and I don't deserve to be rejected. And I, I do that self-talk. It keeps me angry and cold. So... I get playful and warm, and when my child is doing things to push me away, like uh, they roll their eyes, okay, that <laughs> parents, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in, instead of me being pushed away and the child controlling me by, ooh, don't you talk, and I lean back, I get closer and I say, oh my goodness, your eyes, they're rolling around in your head. Let me help you. Okay, look up. Look over here, look down, look. we'll do like some exercises to get, so I get closer and I get playful, 
And then you know when you have a child who rolls their eyes, when you turn to walk away, they're going to do the whole, whole same thing again. I said, oh my goodness, your eyes are rolling around in your head again. Let me help you. Look up, look over here, look. And we'll do that five times. I say, big hug. I say, it's a good thing you have a mom like me to help you with that because your eyes have gotten really weak. And do they do this in the Netherlands? Yeah. Okay. The middle finger, when they put their middle finger out, um, they do it. So you know, I'm a good old angry. And so I get closer. Oh, let me check. Oh, there must be a cramp in your finger. It got all stiff and stuck up there. You know, I want you to do some exercise. Snap for work some of the kinks out of there. Yeah. See if you can work that out. Oh, yeah. My goodness. That was very stiff. It's a good thing you have a mom like me to help you. So they want us to get angry and move away. I get happy and I move toward them and I touch. And then, you know, when you have a child that does that, you turn to walk away. Their finger's going to have another cramp real quick. And then you go, oh my goodness, it's cramping again. Get some exercise. Oh. <laughs> so I don't let their sickness control our relationship. Where they get stiff, I get warmer and softer until they get warmer and softer. And when they're working to make me angry, you know, then I see that and I intentionally will do the opposite. So I learned how to be oppositional by some of the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's what you also taught me with the, with the eye rolling. I did that, and uh, she, what Jasmine also does, like, and I always say, well, "That's a good thing. Keep breathing. Keep breathing." It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then at one point it stops because mm -hmm. it's no power anymore. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And another thing that comes up to me now is that, um, and I'm very bad at that. Um, we as moms, at one point forget all about ourselves until we turn into like burnout, depression, and uh, how can we yeah, deal with that, or how can we help ourselves? That is very, very important. You're so right, Esther. We have to fill ourselves up, or we run out of fuel to give. We don't have the laughter and the joyfulness anymore, we just <laughs> because we're empty, and we have given and given and given till there's nothing left. So because the children don't give back to us, but if it's possible, find ways to, um, to have a break, even if it's maybe a couple of hours at the neighbor or uh, walking a dog over a neighbor. Maybe that's they need to be. Oh, no, no, no. no. Yes, <laughs> that's yes, pretty healthy. Yeah, no, yes, they can do that now. But <laughs> if they're not um, treated, then maybe not all the kids. But you need to find ways to have a... Yeah, separation that they can go to a nice, safe place that everybody feels good, and um, yeah, and we created that, so that's uh, almost a must, I think. Oh, absolutely, and you know, I'm so glad that you brought that up because we do want to wish you a Merry Christmas, <laughs> and we're all in the holiday season right now, and it is a time of sharing love and giving, and we hope that your children will learn how to share love and how to give back to you because you deserve it. And we both want to thank you so much for all you do for the children, and we hope that someday they will thank you. But yeah. for today, we will thank yeah. you. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. We know it's late there in the Netherlands, and you have... You're busy doing Santa Claus. I completely <laughs> forgot, about, uh, forgot about it, but uh, <laughs> this is our gift to you. Yeah, this is our uh, cadeau to you. Yeah, uh, so thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.